we go to our next um, presenter and panelists, just want to make sure you're taking the time not only to reflect, but jot questions and comments down as we move forward towards the point in time when the audience will be able to engage with our panelists. Hi, right, well, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Um, this is a very important mm -hmm. topic. Uh, <clears throat> I have a okay, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so th this uh, title, Standardized Testing, Mend It, Don't End It, is probably about as provocative as anything you'll hear from me. I'm usually presenting results of my research, but um, this is a, a nice opportunity to reflect um, on the input to the research that I do and that other people do, which is the, uh, the test score data. Um, so I am not an expert in politics, but just to try to summarize what I come away with from listening to, uh, to people talk about testing is that you have um, sort of on one side there are people arguing for testing every grade and every subject and every year. We need to track students over time and use these results for uh, accountability. Um, and um, uh, this other group that, um, you know, criticize this approach and or raise uh, important concerns that uh, existing tests are not capturing higher order thinking skills, they narrow the curriculum, um, we need to end the high stakes associated with them, um, they, they, you know, they stress out students and teachers, um, and that we shouldn't use these tests for evaluating teachers, and ultimately um, you hear a lot of voices calling for boycotts of standardized testing. So, um, I mean, I come at, at this um, as, as a researcher who uses, who needs to measure educational outcomes. So I'm tasked with, um, hey, we have this intervention, we want to know if it works, right? And we want to know rigorously, you know, not just sort of anecdotes and, you know, feel-good stories, but hard evidence on are we going to invest a whole lot of money in this strategy or in this other strategy because there's a lot at stake, okay? Um, and the same thing goes for, I mean, it's the same methods whether you're evaluating a curriculum a governance, you know, a change to the way that we organize schools, um, including, uh, you know, policies about um, uh, teachers and determining which teachers are more effective than others and which in, 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 um, in promoting student learning and in which schools are doing the right things as well. Um, so um, really both sides are right in this. We need to measure what matters to us. We need to measure it as much, as, you know, when people say, you know, we're obsessed with data. Um, I mean, I would, you know, say guilty as charged. It's like a barber would, should, is obsessed with hair. Um, they probably should be. Um, but um, obviously the word obsession in, in, uh, implies unhealthy attachment, and that's what we certainly want to avoid. Um, and that's why I want to mention that the, the critics of existing standardized tests are, are, are right in pretty much Every, every point. You know, we heard a really uh, a whole series of problems associated with standardized testing, and they're all, these are concerns we have to fix. You know, we can't let it go on that, that, that curricula are being narrowed, kids are being denied, uh, you know, are not being taught um, in higher order thinking skills because they're not on the test, then we gotta figure out how to make the test capture higher order thinking skills. At least that would be my, my argument. So that's the, the mend it, don't end it part. So let me, I mean, let me sort of make a um, um, uh, proposal that um, that I think a lot of this is semantics. I think we have two gr we have groups of people who are talking past each other, um, and so one of the things I'm going to try to do today is clarify some terms to see if we can get on the same page or at least generate a discussion about that. That's why I specifically said standardized testing because th those are dirty words. Um, I don't think they need to be. I'm going to try to clean them up a little. Um, and also, um, you know, a discussion like this would be incomplete if we didn't at least talk about what are what what should we be measuring. Um, and I think we heard some. Fortunately, that that part of the of the um, conversation was mostly taken care of just now. We heard a really a lot of really good examples of a, a performance assessment consortium that's doing what sounds like great work and trying to figure out what really is important, what should we be measuring, and what what are the important outcomes of of education. Um, and then I would just propose, and this might start to get it at the answer to your question, Dr. Janey, about you know how, how do we get change? How do we move from where we are to where we need to be? And 
I don't know. From my perspective, I always find that um, there's somebody there who's making these decisions about what tests to buy and wh you know what 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 makes a good test and where we should invest our resources in selecting a test vendor and and demanding certain uh, criteria of those of those assessments. That's sort of an important pressure point. And you know, I was sort of hoping that maybe somebody in the audience has that as their job description, and they could identify themselves during the Q and A and 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 uh, <laughs> help me understand whether they they can um, whether I'm identifying the right audience for this forum. So let's let's start from with this uh, standardized testing, this dirty word, um, and really standardized testing just means that everyone standardized just means that everyone takes the same test under the same conditions. Right? That's not to be confused with the item format, the dreaded multiple choice, which, as any of us would attest, is really limited. Right? Um, you know, I, I teach at the university level, and um, it's very tempting. If I did multiple choice, my grading would be really easy. Um, and, but it, it's obviously, it would give me a much weaker signal of what my students have learned um, or how deeply they've learned it. Um, it's not a very... It's not a great item format. It's a really good item format in some ways. It has some good properties about it. But, um, you know, constructed response item formats, including, you know, essays and performances and portfolios and, you know, short answer, things that elicit whether students understand and how. How do you solve this problem, not what is the answer? Um, all of these things are what we should be investing our energy in if that's the best way to measure what students know and can do. So the, the hard part is how do we standardize that in a way that we can, that, that a teacher in one classroom working with their students um, can, um, can generate results that go outside, that, that ha can travel farther than just that classroom, right? And can have some idea of whether the, the progress they're making, you know, is that a lot or a little, right? Other than their own individual uh, judgment. I mean, we have 15,000 school districts and 2 million teachers. That's, that's a lot of, um, uh, th that's a large workforce and a large um, um, population to, um, to sort of reinvent the wheel. I think uh, uh, we, we spend a lot on, on this in this area, as people have noted, and we've got to find out ways to do it more efficiently. And part of that is by helping different groups of educators learn from each other and come up with um, uh, uh, measures that we can then use, because otherwise if I have everybody individually coming up with their own metrics and then I try to determine, all right, is the curriculum that you did here that you didn't do in this other school any good, you can't do it. The, we, apples to oranges. So we need at least some level of, of standardization. And I want to just, that, that's my point, is that it's not the same thing as, as item format. Um, another phrase, dirty phrase we hear about uh, a lot is teaching to the test. Um, now, of course, there's a good kind of teaching to the test and a bad kind of teaching to the test. Um, so teaching narrowly to the test is the bad kind, all right? Um, you know, overemphasizing test-taking strategy um, and over content, right? So the, we think about, um, well, let's, let's talk about the, the good kind of teaching to the test, which is would, would be um, teaching to the domain of the test, right? So let's say we have some assessment, and it's designed to measure, you know, what kids learn in fourth grade, I have a fourth grader, uh, you know, is, is a lot of stuff, right? And you can't sort of measure whether they've learned every single thing. So you have, you know, item banks and different, you know, ways to measure all the, the kinds of things. That measuring everything that, uh, that kids in my son's class have learned over the year would take too much time. So you need a sample. You need a random sample of everything that they're learning. Um, and um, so test items would be a, a random sample of all these possible elements of the course content. And teachers should cover everything. You don't want them just covering what's on the test. You know, the dreaded question if you're a teacher is, so is this going to be on the test? It doesn't matter. We're, here, we're all about learning, not about doing well on the test uh, at, at the expense of learning. So uh, teachers should cover, should test, uh, teach the, the domain of the test. Now, that assumes that these things are aligned, right? Without curriculum alignment between assessment and and uh, and the content, you know, none of this works, right? So that's that's an important qualifier. And I don't want to assume that we're there yet. Okay. Um, so um, all right. So the next um, sort of uh, 
uh, issue that we hear about, maybe, you know, is um, I get this question a lot. You know, oh, I'm not sure we can use this as a norm reference test. Uh, we need to use a criterion reference test. And uh, one of the things that, that I often point out is that norm reference and cr criterion reference, of course, are just not properties of tests. They're properties of the interpretation of the test. So if we're given, let's say you have a score of 270 and, um, you know, you can you want to know, you know, what does that mean? You want to interpret it. One way is to look at all the people in, in your state who took that same test, all the other test takers in the same grade level, and look at their distribution of their scores and see where do you fit on that distribution. And let's say 270 in this example would put you in the 28th percentile, and that's information. I mean, that's not everything you need to know, but that's some information. That's one way to interpret tests. Another way of interpreting a test is to go out and ask educators and say, well, okay, well, what is this score? How difficult are these items? And, and you know, which level is, um, you know, can we put labels on if you know this much, is that really what we expect? And that requires expert interpretation, right, expert judgment. And so you can get committees of people to come and, and set criteria for um, what makes, you know, a score high or low. And in this case, um, we might, um, sorry, if we can just go back. Uh, um, just put that up back on the screen for a second. Um, the same score could have a, a criterion reference interpretation as well. In this case, it might be that uh, score is, well, below basic or basic or whatever labels that um, that the educator community has, has uh, collectively uh, assigned. Um, and the final issue that um, we hear about a lot, uh, concern, is over high-stakes tests. And this, I would also say, this is a really important and valid concern. Um, so, um, I mean, high-stakes decisions are, are being made, um, you know, with or without uh, student achievement information. Uh, teacher hiring, it's all the teacher decisions, personnel decisions, like hiring and promotion, assignment, compensation, remediation. Um, and... Um, uh, as well as decisions about students and the decisions about education interventions. You know, should we implement this this model or not? And there's a lot, some of them are fads, and teachers might want to know, is this a fad or is this a real thing? Is this going to really improve, you know, be good for me? And, um, and sometimes they're spending a lot of money and creating a lot of change and disruption in a school. And, um, and so the question is, what information are, going to, are we going to use to... Um, uh, to make these decisions. So I've, you know, uh, written, um, you know, commentary about this topic more generally about imperfect information being better than no information as long as we're smart about how to interpret signals from noisy data. That's actually turned out to be a controversial position. But um, uh, I think really what we need to focus on here is the problem with high-stakes tests that I, you know, um, is that they create anxiety, right? Test taking anxiety being, uh, uh, you know, for both for students and for teachers, right? And, and stress and, 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 you know, so we have to think, what's, how, do we, how do we address that problem? How do we reduce, uh, you know, the, the concern about test taking to, to healthy levels, right? Um, I say not eliminate it because, you know, um, you, know you want people to take... Um, take this stuff seriously. Um, and so one of the biggest concerns might be, uh, the, and, and that concerns me a lot, is a mismatch between what we're testing and either what the content of the, uh, is being taught and what should be taught and, uh, or just the difficulty level, right? So if you give a, a, you know, try to come up with a one-size-fits-all, you know, test and you have students who are you know, just not at the, don't know the material that's on it, yeah, they're going to be stressed out, and the teacher's going to be stressed out about how they're going to uh, perform, and you're going to have kids in tears. That's, that, we have a problem when that happens, and it happens with some frequency. I've been reading um, a lot on this topic lately, and, and discover, you know, it's disturbing uh, some of the negative consequences of standardized tests that you see in places where the administration involves, you know, a, a difficulty mismatch. We don't have the kind of adaptive testing that would allow us to match, at least match the difficulty level to the level where the students are. Also, the format of the tests and the time pressure of the tests, might be, we may have that all wrong, right? Um, again, 
you know, there are different concerns for, early, you know, young kids than for older kids. There are kids who, you know, who are, might be, have been excellent students throughout the year, but the, the format of the test holds them back from, you know, uh, from providing the evidence that we need to, um, uh, you know, um, to demonstrate their mastery. That's a problem, okay? That's a challenge. Uh, we need another format. We need accommodations. Now, I would say test, I'm not a test developer or anything, but I think test developers, are one of the things that they try to do anyway is to, is, is to come up with, um, make sure that accommodations to, to standardized tests can be developed in such a way that, you know, we can, uh, we can interpret the scores to mean the same thing, even if some students need an untimed test or larger print or, you know, they need to be isolated while they're taking it or chew gum or whatever it is to, to uh, deal with um, the barriers to demonstrating their, their proficiency. And the same thing goes with time pressure. So these are all test design issues that we need to tackle first um, rather than saying, oh, well, it's because we're going to make an important decision, right? Because if we're going to make an important decision and there's a, you know, and, and there's a big test that I have to prepare for, but I'm, you know, but it's, the test is aligned to what I know and what I've learned, then, I mean, I should be worried because it has high stakes, but, you know, that's, that's pretty much always going to happen. It's going to happen in life. And, and one of the things about performance assessments is that we want them to sort of mimic, we want them to be authentic, to mimic the kinds of trials that we'll face uh, beyond school. So, um, you know, what I've done so far is just, you know, pull out some of the language and try to give, you know, um, some more, I don't know, interpretation to what some of these term terminology, some of this terminology means. Um, I think it's, of course, important to say, all right, well, what properties of assessments uh, do we need in order to, um, to, to, to use them? And this, um, I guess we can just sort of list these out. I don't have to go one by one necessarily, but, you know, validity and then reliability are the two obvious properties of any kind of assessment, whether it's a constructive response or, um, or a multiple choice or any item format is that you need to know that it's going to measure something we care about, right? That's, that's sort of one of the key aspects of validity. And if it doesn't, we're wasting our time. And, and, it's, and it's very, you know, I was going to, I originally had a, a slide in my deck that said good tests are good and bad tests are bad. I mean, that seems sort of obvious, but that's really, you know, true here. Maybe I'm, I'm trying hard to find something I won't get criticized for. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, in bias, you know, the psychometricians have this term diff, you know, differential item functioning. But if a test is going to, you know, be uh, not measure profici proficiency or measure, you know, poorly for certain ethnic groups that we got a big problem. So all of these things, you know, if you're policing the test, you have to care about reliability. You know, if two people score the same test, they should get, you know, results that are, you know, in the same bench ballpark. What would it mean if we had, you know, these wonderful, you know, authentic assessments of students' ability and then, you know, the score, you know, how you did, you know, the feedback that you get as a student or as a teacher teaching those students completely depends on who's looking at it. That would be upsetting to the teacher. That, that teacher would, would, the anxiety problem would still be there, um, maybe even work more so. That's another, you know, substituting one, one form of anxiety for another. And, and so we need reliability and we need the, these assessments to be discriminating over the whole range of ability that students come in with, right? So that means that if we have students with major deficits, we need to find ways to measure the progress that they've made from where they start off. And the same thing goes for students at the high end, um, you know, or students who are, you know, tests are multidimensional. I don't mean to sort of oversimplify. Other properties that are very, we, we, you know, we focus a lot, psychometricians focus a lot on validity and reliability. I'm going to put some, not, some uh, uh, layperson terms up here as well. Non-corruptible, you know, uh, you know, Cheating is obviously, you know, like the death knell of, of credibility for any kind of assessment system. And so, you know, there, there's, it's, this is usually a property of the way a test is, uh, or, or assessment is administered. Um, but um, it also has to elicit students' best effort, right? Um, I remember tutoring students who told me about the, the shapes that they made with the, with the fill in the bubbles, you know, because they were, you, they hit a certain age and they're no longer motivated by just, okay, we're going to do this and then they just do it. Once your kids get older, um, you do have incentive issues with performing on tests. Um, and now maybe in some sense, maybe if you're asking a student to, you know, 
to perform a musical composition and you know just the pressure of having people listen to it um, might be sufficient. But each one of these formats might have strengths and weaknesses along these dimensions. Um, burden is an important uh, aspect of test. As I mentioned, this anxiety problem is one that we cannot, we cannot afford to ignore, right? Um, you know, we have to think, would, it, would an institutional review board allow us to administer this test? Is it ethical, um, you know, to, to make somebody suffer through it if it really is suffering? Um, now, if they're suffering because they didn't, you know, they didn't prepare for it, you know, that's different. Um, and then finally, uh, interpretability is an important property of tests uh, or any kind of assessment because it has to support decision making for teaching and learning. That's the bottom line, right? And that includes, um, uh, you know, things like developing a vertical scale. So my, you know, my hope is that we can do this. You know, I'm, I'm sort of both optimistic, but also I should be somewhat humble because it's not me that would be doing this. It would be developers of tests and educators, and and teams of people who. Uh, I would hope would be able to develop better ways to measure student uh, abilities, uh, proficiency that makes sense so we can compare, you know, kids across very different circumstances. Because if we can't, we're, we're going to be very limited in what we can derive from all, you know, I don't want to put, nobody wants to put kids through a lot of, you know, trials and tribulations if we can't then do important things with that information. So finally, just to conclude, um, uh, you know, standardized testing doesn't have to be multiple choice, but I mean, I don't think that standardization is necessarily the, the problem. Um, and if a test is aligned to the curriculum, then teaching broadly to it might be a good thing. This is the counterintuitive point that I was making earlier. Um, and, you know, it can be useful to compare test takers to each other as well as to absolute standards that we have, whether it's an individual's subjective. Uh, standard or a group's collectively uh, collective standard, and that the cost of making tests better, and this is where I'm not sure I'm on such solid ground, but I'm going to, again, I'm being optimistic because uh, it's not me that has to do it, but I'm hoping this is true, that the cost of making, uh, of, of coming up with better ways to assess uh, students' proficiency is um, going to be less than the cost of making these really hard decisions uh, in the absence of, of evidence. So um, with that, I you know, look forward to hearing some discussion and uh, input.